Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for the event Mastering Test Automation, How to Use Selenium Successfully. My name is Adi, and I'm the events moderator. First of all, I want to make sure the sound is working. So if you can hear me OK, please use the raise your hand option in the control panel on your right. So show of hands if you can hear me. OK, awesome. I, th I think that you can. So today's event features leading test automation expert Dave Hafner, author of the Selenium Guidebook and writer of Elemental Selenium free once weekly Selenium tip newsletter. Just before I hand over the microphone to Dave, a bit of administrative stuff. First of all, feel free to ask questions during the webinar. You can do that in the GoToWebinar control panel on your right. Dave will try to answer as many questions as possible at the Q&A session at the end. But even if we don't get to your question, after the webinar, we'll email you a personal answer. This webinar is recorded and will be made avail available for on-demand viewing. A link to it will be emailed to you tomorrow. For optimal viewing experience, I strongly recommend you close off any unnecessary apps running in the background. And also, if you encounter any technical issues, please send me a private message in the chat room, also on, in the control panel, and I will try to take care of it as soon as possible. So now let's kick off. Dave, the stage is yours. Great. Thanks, Adi. OK, so hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me. So this is How Do You Slam Successfully? And I'd like to start off by talking briefly about how I got started with test automation with Selenium. Um, when I first got started, I felt that it was a lot like this picture here, this chasm where uh, there's two different cliffs and there's no clear path between the two. Where I felt like I was was on the left-hand side, where I was just starting out with test automation. I didn't really have any background in, in software development or programming. Um, and on the right side was people that I had met or heard about that apparently had succeeded with test automation with Selenium. And this is back um, in you know, 2008, 2009, and Selenium, you know, was, was fairly popular and prominent at that point and, and stable and pretty widely used in the industry, but documentation was was pretty poor and uh, there weren't a lot of good um, resources available to kind of learn how to do things fit for your context. And so what I, what I learned, instead of it being like this scene here where it feels very dire, uh, is actually that test automation um, with Selenium and test automation in general is actually more like a puzzle. It's more like a Rubik's Cube. So a Rubik's Cube, um, for those not familiar, is, uh, for some people, is, is kind of an intimidating puzzle, but the gist of it is pretty straightforward. Regardless of the orientation of the colors um, of the puzzle, you can actually apply the same patterns every time and solve it. And so I posit that you can do the same thing with Selenium in your organization. And so what I'm going to step through is what I found through my consulting practice and working various companies um, and writing about the topic for several years now, um, sharing with you kind of the 10 step process of how I, I think every company can achieve success with test automation with Selenium. And so before I step into that, I just like to kind of level set expectations and say this, like talk about why we do this. And this, these two sentences really sum it up in my perspective. So everybody here on this call should be wanting to write business valuable tests that are reusable, maintainable, and resilient across all relevant browsers. And then you want to package those tests up and scale them so that not just you, but people on your team can use them. There we go. So let's start by talking briefly about a Selenium overview. So Selenium, what it is, um, the Reader's Digest version. So if you were to ask the creator of Selenium, Jason Huggins, he would tell you that Selenium is a software robot sent from the future to help us test websites. It's an actual quote, and if you ask him, I'm assuming he would still hold true to that. Um, so what it really is, is a browser automation tool. It is a tool built specifically for driving the browser by mimicking human action. And so it's really good at that. It's really good at doing things like clicking on buttons, typing text in input fields, and, and just things that you would assume that a human would be able to do. It's meant to replicate those actions. And um, there are different formats of Selenium. 
there is the the more notable version, uh, which is uh, how Selenium gained a lot of prop, uh, popularity, which is Selenium IDE, uh, which is a record and playback tool, which is a browser extension for Firefox um, that enables you to quickly record tests. But really, the goal of IDE was to capture tests quickly and then export them into code. That was the original intent of the tool. Um, and so once you export those tests into code, then you can run them locally, and then you can run them on uh, remotely on a grid, and that's how you're able to scale them outward and, and use different browsers and operating system combinations. And Selenium has a bad rap about being slow, brittle, and hard to maintain. Um, and that's just, uh, it's very possible to have that happen, but it's simply not true. There are patterns and practices, which I'll talk about, which can address all of those issues. And so now we can dive into step one which is how uh, to define a test strategy. And I don't mean kind of this heady, uh, hand-wavy consultant speak. Um, I'm, I'm actually talking about really four simple questions to ask. And the first one is, how does your business make money? Uh, and if you don't deal directly in dollars and cents, then you can think about, well, how do you, what features generate the most value for your users? The next is, what features of your application are actually being used by your users. And most everyone here should be able to have access to usage data to discern what features those are. And also within that usage data, you should be able to discern what browsers um, and operating systems, et cetera, are your users actually using to visit the application that's being tested. And then also what things have broken in the app before. And so this might not be as easy to find as looking at usage data, but you should be able to figure this out pretty quickly. Um, there's a couple different ways. There's like defect tracking software that you could look at to see what things have broken before. And then there's just general conversation. Uh, the easiest thing is like when there's a software release, just look for the software developer that's sweating the most because there's probably a feature going out that makes them very nervous. So the outcome of these questions, uh, what features to test and then which browsers to care about. In the myriad of limitless possibilities, you know, people want to reach for automation and just say, let's just automate everything, which is uh, a bad idea. So really you want to start with like, what is the critical uh, subset of features of the app and which browsers so you can start with just the critical pieces and start there. So step two is picking a programming language. So um, the first question people typically ask is, should we use the same language as the application that we're testing? We have developers who write code in this language, so if we get stuck, we could potentially, uh, we could potentially reach, reach out to them for help. And a better question, I think, to ask is actually who's going to own the test automation code? And, uh, and what, this typically opens up a series of questions like, um, well, what skills do we have amongst the team? What excites us, et cetera? And, and really, there's, there's no one you know, solid answer for this, but really who owns it opens up the conversation, which helps people come to a conclusion about what makes the most sense for the context of the team of who's going to own it. And the second question, which is often overlooked, is do we build a framework or use an existing one? And uh, there are numerous open source Selenium frameworks out there. I'm slowly uh, collecting a list of all the potential ones that are out there for every programming language that's supported by Selenium. So if you go to that link, uh, you can see a list for each programming language. And then once you've kind of figured all that out, you're like, okay, well, let's step through, like make sure we're using Selenium the right way, step three. And let's talk briefly about some Selenium fundamentals, which um, as I mentioned before, mimics human action. The way it works is that it uses a few common actions and those actions work with what's called locators. And locators are what tell Selenium which HTML element to interact with on the page. And so the common actions that you're going to be using most frequently with Selenium. The first one is you have to, of course, visit the page, so you need to get a URL. And then there's find element. This is the most common thing you're going to use. You first have to find an element before you can actually interact with it. Then once you've found it, you can do things like click on it. So if it's like a link or a button, you can click it. If it's a form, you could submit it, which isn't necessarily like mimicking human action, but you get the gist. Um, you can send keys. That's how you type in Selenium. And then there's questions you can ask the page. You can say, is it displayed? Uh, 
Um, the cool thing about is displayed is that under the hood, Selenium actually is doing several different checks to make sure that it can discern as best as it can that it, the thing you're about to to take an action on, like when you say is displayed, and it says if it is or isn't, it's actually doing a whole bunch of checks to make sure it actually is displayed to to the user. So there's various different locator strategies, um, and rather than kind of take in this whole list and just try to grok what it means. The way I think about locators is that they should be unique, descriptive, and unlikely to change. And so that rolls a few of these out. And the best advice I have is to start with IDs and classes. And when those aren't available or those just don't really serve what you're trying to do, then use CSS selectors or XPath. Uh, but use them with care because it's very easy to write uh, very brittle and very slow um, locators using CSS selectors or XPath, but they do offer a great amount of power um, and solve a lot of problems. So the the thing I'll leave with on this slide here is that um, a lot of teams kind of grapple with, well, which do we use, CSS selectors or XPath? And there used to be this um, argument within the Selenium testing space about which one was more performant. It used to be that one of them was far slower than the other, but that's no longer the issue. I re-ran the benchmarks um, a year and a half ago at this point and found that there's a negligible difference in performance speeds between the two, um, where CSS ekes out just a little bit, but really the benefit is choosing what you and your team are comfortable with and what makes the most sense between just the test team that ha handles the automation and the actual front-end team that's building the UI, so that there's like a common language between them. So. And if you're curious about the differences between CSS selectors and XPath, then check out this second link here. Uh, it's a resource page that has a comparison of how to do certain things between CSS selectors and XPath. And then in terms of finding quality locators, um, if you're new to this, um, then you might not be aware that every modern web browser today has this ability to inspect the page. Um, so you can right click on an element in the page, click inspect, element and it's going to pop up a little developer console and show you the markup of the page, the HTML of the page. Um, and then once you've found the thing that you actually want to interact with with Selenium, you want to verify your selection. You can do this in a number of different ways. The best way to do it is from your browser. And uh, there's a couple of plugins. This is kind of an older school way to do it, but uh, if you're using Firefox, and then you'd invariably be using Firebug potentially. And there's a plugin for that. Um, there's one called Firepath, there's one called Firefinder, they both do the same thing. But what they enable you to do is, within the little developer console, they enable you to type in a locator, either a CSS selector or an XPath, and it will actually highlight on the screen in the viewport uh, the element for the locator you just typed. So it helps you visually verify that the locator you're going to use is doing what you expect. And um, I actually have a write-up on how to do that here if you want kind of a long form copy version of it. Um, the alternative way, which is kind of the, the simplest thing, there's no additional installs, um, is within the JavaScript console, in the developer console. So if you're using Chrome, you can use this first option, which is $2 signs, and then in parens, you you put your locator within uh, within quotes, and then end with a semicolon. Um, that's just built into Chrome. Uh, if the page that you're interacting with has jQuery, uh, you can do this latter option, which will work on any browser. Um, there's also the option of if you're new to CSS selectors and you want like a resource for learning how to do more with them, then check out this link here. It's uh, it's a fun little game with these <laughs> these dancing plates, and you have to use CSS selectors to like shoot things off the plate. So it's a good way to kind of brush up quickly on your CSS selectors. And and really, out of all of these, these are all great. But the best thing you could possibly do is if you're trying to write something, write an automated test on a page and it just doesn't make sense really. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have a clear sense of how to accomplish what you're trying to do. Have a conversation with the people who are building or have built the user interface that you're trying to automate. Because odds are they'll be able to just point you to a locator that exists that can solve your, your need or add one. And that'd be far more efficient than slaving away for hours trying to get something to work that might work but will be very brittle typically. And so the FireFinder uh, path here is like this. So you'd inspect the page, click on FireFinder. After, I'm sorry, after you, of course, inspect the page, you say, oh, I see an ID of login. 
So open FireFinder, plug in the syntax, and then pound login would be the ID, and then there's a pound username, and there's also an ID of password on the input field. And as we type each of these locators, we can see we found uh, the actual element, the locator that we want to use. So now that we have all that, we can write our first test. A um, couple of points on writing a good test, though. Um, there are some, some common traits of a good test. Uh, the first one is the, the most fundamental, which is um, you want to write your test so that it will work with um, some kind of test framework that already exists, so like a behavior-driven development or a unit testing framework. And in the examples I'm going to step through is Java and JUnit, JUnit being the test framework that I'm going to build these tests for. And then every test that I write, I strive to make sure that it is atomic, that it tests just one thing. That way when there's a failure, it's very clear as to what the failure is, it's very crisp. And then I want to make sure that each test can be run independently so that they're autonomous. And this is a huge uh, pain in the butt for some people. There's an upfront cost to making sure that each of your tests are autonomous, but there's a huge, huge payoff um, down the road when you go to amass you know, hundreds if not thousands of tests and you want to run them in parallel so that you can make your test runs go extremely quickly. So in order to do that, you need to make sure that your tests can be run autonomous of each other. There's no inner test dependencies, et cetera. And then you want to make sure that anyone can understand what the test is doing. And ideally, this includes yourself um, months from now after you write the test and come back to it. And then uh, one that might not be intuitive um, is you want to group similar tests together because the two most common these last two bullets speak to kind of the two most common challenges of, of programming, what to name things and where to put them. So you want to make sure that you group similar tests together in like a similar folder structure. If it happens later that you want to run tests from disparate folders um, together, you don't have to physically move them. There's ways to handle this within the unit testing framework, which speaks to some of the huge benefits which are just implied. But if you use a unit testing framework, there's just a lot of features you get for free. So now that we have all that covered, let's step through just a quick brief example, a login example. So if we were to use Selenium to log in, um, we'd visit the login form, and then we'd have to find the login form's username field using the locator that we verified, and then we would input text into it once we found it. Same thing goes for the password field. And then we find the submit button and click it, or we could find the form and submit the form. And so I have an example here on this open source project I, I created and I maintain called the internet. Um, so you could say I created the internet. And this is a standard example of logging into a website. And so if we take the locators and the URL and create Selenium mans, this is what they look like. Um, I've omitted the setup and teardown for Selenium, but this is the gist. You'd get a URL as a string, you'd find the element by its ID, uh, alternatively, you could use a CSS selector, but we have access to an ID, obviously, so we use that, and then we send keys once we find it for both the username and the password, and then we submit. And then if we take this and package it up into a simple JUnit test, this is what that would look like. So at the top of the class, there's importing the different classes we need for Selenium and the JUnit annotations. Um, at the top of the class, there is the field variable for WebDriver, which where we're storing the instance of Selenium. It's, it's just going to be a driver variable. And then there's three methods. The first one is setup. And there's an annotation, the at symbol, and before above it. That makes it so this method will run before any of the tests, any method with at test in this class. And so we're setting up by creating a instance of Firefox for Selenium, which is the easiest one to do because that's just available out of the box with no additional configuration with Selenium. And then the second method is the actual test. You'll notice the at test annotation. And it's a helpfully named method just called succeeded because this is a happy path test. We drop in our Selenium commands and then there's the teardown, uh, which is with, uh, annotated with the at after. And we're using uh, driver.quit, which will actually close the browser. So if we ran this, it would work. Um, but it wouldn't actually be testing anything because it just go to the page, do its thing, and that's it. It wouldn't actually verify if the state of the page was correct or not. So what we need to do is log in um, manually, of course, inspect the page, find a locator that we want to actually key our assertion off of, verify it, and then uh, add an assertion. Sorry, uh, verify it and then assert it in our test. 
And so just stepping through what that looks like here, we step in manually. And then there's a couple things we could actually inspect on the page here. So there's the sign up button, which is like the most obvious place, but there's nothing really semantic on there. And so what we do is look at the flash notice. Um, and actually there is some semantic markup here, this flash success message, which uh, denotes that we successfully logged in. So let's use that. And we'll verify the selector. And in CSS selector parlance, a class starts with a dot. And if there are two words in the class uh, markup, then in the attribute, then we actually would concatenate them together. So it'd be dot flash dot success. So if we plug this into our test we just wrote, it would look like this. We're using uh, an assert method of assert true, and then we are um, placing a helpful failure message that will trigger if this fails. It would say success message not present. And then we have the action that we want to perform, which is we're finding by CSS selector the flash success message. And then we're asking Selenium if it is displayed. And this will return a Boolean. It will return true or false. Um, and if we run this, then it will actually test the page. Um, and as I mentioned before, is displayed actually does a bunch of different checks to make sure that this element is actively displayed uh, to the user as best as, as it can tell. And the, this, uh, the line below it, the last line in the test method, um, this commented out, is the same line as above it, but I have fat fingered the locator. And this is a reminder for me always to remember to force a failure of a test before I can trust it. So I want to make sure I can see that the test failed like I think, and that way when it passes, I can reasonably trust it. So just, just something to remember, always, always uh, make sure that your test is doing what you expect before you can put it into production, your production cycles for testing. So that's how to do it the standard way with assertions, but there is a much better way to handle assertions uh, with Selenium. So I'm not sure most of you heard of this, but automated visual testing, it's like, it's like the coolest thing I found um, in the last couple of years. I've spent the last couple of years actually researching it and writing about it and playing with it. And it's really cool. So um, it's a way to verify that an application's UI appears correctly. And it's, it does an, a myriad of different things um, to potentially help make that happen. But the gist of it is that it can also be used to verify content, not just the layout. Um, and the big, big point I want to drive home is that it's basically giving you hundreds of assertions for a few lines of code. And so there's a bunch of different open source libraries that are available. At last count, I think it was something close to 16 or 20 different ones that are available. Um, almost all of them do the same thing. It's basically what's called baseline image comparison. And what that does is you, you write your test, it goes to a specific part of your app, and then it takes a snapshot. And then you verify that that is the way that the page should look. And then in future subsequent runs, the that you'll get to that same point an image will be taken again it will be compared to that initial baseline image uh, what varies is is how these different libraries actually handle that comparison and what they do with it some do very strict matching where it's like pixel for pixel comparison others do much more sophisticated things um, but within all uh, visual testing there are inherent challenges in terms of complexity um, and also in terms of the different false positives that, that can happen um, but there is, uh, there's actually one solution I found that, that just kind of works across the board really well, um, and that's Apple Tools Eyes. And so I actually have a roundup. Um, I really do my best. I cannot in good conscience recommend something uh, that's commercial without kind of vetting against all open source of, uh, options. So I have this blog post here, which I encourage everyone to check out, where I kind of show, um, showcase all the different options that are available and then step through using an open source one and then step through all the different limitations of it and then compare it against something like Apple Tools Eyes. So worth a, worth a look. So let's step through an example. And so with Apple Tools Eyes, they have an SDK for um, almost every programming language, if not every by now. Um, but for Java in your Palm XML, assuming this is a Maven project that you're using, you can just drop in the I Selenium Java SDK. The latest version right now is 2.31. And so then we take our test. Um, and then what we can do uh, is just zoom in real quick here and make some modifications. Um, so the first thing we end up doing is we import the Apple, Apple Tools Eyes class. And then we create a field variable to store the Eyes instance. And then here in the setup, we make some modifications. We're still getting 
Firefox, but we're storing it in a local variable for right now because um, we're going to pass that into Apple Tools Eyes, which will then return us uh, a, a slightly modified session that enables it. This will enable Apple Tools Eyes to take pictures as it needs. And so we create an instance of Eyes, and then we set the API key. Um, and in this example, I'm pulling from uh, an, a local environment variable, but you can just as easily hard code something here if you needed or had that as your preference. And then uh, the driver object is where we're create, calling eyes.open, sending the instance of Firefox, and along with it, the name of the app that we're testing and the name of the test. Um, these can, of course, be abstracted and made dynamic, but for right now, just for ease, these are hard-coded. And so in the test, this is where we get to do some cool stuff. So we actually use this eyes variable, uh, this eyes session, and so we're calling check window and we're passing in some, some metadata, basically some helpful name for this action. So what this is doing is um, taking a picture. So we load the page, get to the login page, and then we say check window, this is the login page. So I named it login. And then the next thing happens after we have clicked the submit button. And so check window uh, is, is happening again, and we're just calling it logged in, because the state of the page should be logged in. So this is basically happening at the same time that the assertion would, is happening um, that we wrote before. And then afterwards, we're calling eyes.close. And what's happening with eyes.close is it's actually, this is the step that's going to trigger the comparison between the baseline images and these check window images that are happening. And of course, in the teardown, we do add a cleanup action just to make sure that the, the uh, session for Apple Tools Eyes gets aborted if it's not closed properly. And so, uh, if we run this, uh, this is within IntelliJ in this example, uh, the first time it runs, it'll it'll say, hey, we just recorded some stuff, uh, and we want to make sure that you have a good baseline image. Uh, or if this was a, a subsequent run after you've done this, this would this would be the same thing you'd see. But there's a URL for this you know failed uh, job. And so if you load this in your browser, this is just what the job dashboard looks like for the failed job. And so as we can see here, it's called out that there's, a, there's actually a visual anomaly occurring. So, and we compare it to the baseline image, which shows that the logout button is actually not present when this test, this test ran. And so what we can do is ex decide to accept or reject this. And since this is clearly not something that we want as the baseline, we don't want a missing logout button. We reject it, save it, and then for all subsequent test runs, uh, Apple Tools Eyes will know that that's just not a legit thing. And so we should make sure we flag it each time. It's worth noting that uh, this, uh, this is the current dashboard, but there's also a new dashboard in flight, uh, which, uh, which I'm actually really excited about. Um, and so I'm assuming that that's something that's going to be more readily available to the public coming soon. So that's visual testing. Um, if, you only do one, if you only do one thing to enhance your testing practice, assuming that you see everything else I've talked about and you're like, I've already done all that, then visual testing is absolutely like the one recommendation I think that is hands down like the, the most useful thing you could do for just the least amount of effort. So back to everything else about Selenium. Um, it's worth pointing out that with the traditional assertion that I mentioned, um, that if you actually try to search for something to do the negative case, that Selenium will return an exception. If it looks, if Selenium look for, looks for something on the page that's not there, um, it won't return false, it'll return exception, uh, it'll return a no such element exception, so um, the two most common exceptions you're going to run into, no such element and stale element reference error. Uh, no such element is the case I just mentioned. Stale element is when uh, you have stored uh, a fine element lookup and then you go to interact with it on the page, but it's no longer there. And Selenium kind of freaks out and gives you that stale element reference. Uh, if you want kind of a full list of the numerous uh, exceptions, then check out this link. So uh, the quick way to handle that, you could just do a try catch. Um, and of course, you would want to specify the exception so you're not doing any masking errors. But for the is displayed lookup, we can create a method that does a try catch. And instead of returning exception, we catch it and return false instead. So then we could actually do a true false lookup for the happy, ca happy path and the sad path. So step five, uh, kind of the halfway point here. Um, write reusable and maintainable test code. And so page objects. So um, right now, if we continue the way we're writing our tests, um, we'd be writing our tests directly against the application under test. And if the test and if the application changes, then all the tests could fail. 
and that leaves us having to go to update every single test, and that's just sad. Instead, what we can do is create an object in code that represents the application that we're testing and write our tests against that object. And that way we just need to update just the page object. And so let's take a look at a page object for the login example I just showed you. So here is a simple class. And at the top of the class, we have field variables where we're storing the locators, that, uh, the by locators that we want to use on the page. And then in the constructor, uh, we're receiving the driver object, setting it to a field variable so we can use it throughout this class. And then in the constructor, we're also making sure we end up on the login page, also uh, asserting that the login page is ready to be used. So we're checking to see if the login form is actually displayed. Uh, typical rule here is that um, you never really want to use assertions uh, in page objects um, or outside of your test at all. But this is the one uh, rare exception to that where in the constructor you can do something uh, to check for that. Alternatively to an assertion, you could just uh, raise an exception here potentially instead. And then the next three methods um, are kind of the interesting portion, I think, which is we're capturing the, the behavior of the page. So we have this method called with. So when we use this in the test, it says login with, and then we pass in the username and passwords uh, as strings. So we're making this functionality reusable, and we're using the locators that are stored at the top of the class. And so the, the command should look very familiar. We're finding the username input field, submitting the username, the password, submitting the form, etc. The last two methods are new. That's where we're actually abstracting the lookup um, of the page for the success message or the failure message. So we're basically abstracting all locators from our tests and all the behavior into this page object so that in our test, we're just calling these methods now. So here's what that looks like when we're using it. So the test is a lot cleaner, um, ends up making it so there's no Selenium commands and no locators in our test. And we're able to, now that we have reusability, uh, write a second test. And so we had succeeded for the happy path, and we have failed for the sad path. And so uh, it's just, you know, login.successmessagepresent is how we're getting a Boolean now. And login with Tom Smith's super secret password. So now we have this functionality stored. It's reusable. It's very readable. And if the, if the application changes, we just have to go to one place to fix it. So there's some additional stuff on page objects. Um, rather than just use a plain old uh, Java class, um, there's a couple different libraries. Uh, the first one I'll mention is HTML Elements from a company called Yandex out of uh, Russia, I believe. And uh, it's it's meant to be uh, a helper, helper library to make it easier to uh, write page objects. And the same thing goes for the page factory, which comes built into the Java Selenium bindings. And so, uh, you know, there's basically, there's basically three different ways to, to write your page objects, the simplest being to just write plain old Java classes, but there's some additional functionality that each of these libraries offers, um, and potentially some additional uh, syntax benefits, but it's up to you to choose your own adventure on that. So there's one more concept I do want to cover briefly before moving on to the next step, and that's uh, a base page object. And uh, I've heard this called numerous different things. Uh, I've heard it called a Selenium wrapper, a uh, utility class. Um, there's, you, know, you, you might have a different name for it. But the gist is similar to the page object concept. But right now, uh, we, if we just take this page objects that I just stepped through and like write more of them, we'd be taking all of our Selenium commands and putting them in these page objects. And what we could actually do is pull those up instead into a base class. And what this does is enables us to have global reuse across all of our page objects. So we can solve a problem once and then have it replicate through all of our page objects rather than have potentially duplicative code across our page objects. Um, just like our tests became more readable, our page objects will also become more readable because we'll be creating our own domain specific language. And then of course, um, there's a tertiary benefit which is less of an issue nowadays, but insulation from API changes to Selenium. This was a huge issue when migrating from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Um, and actually, if you're curious about what, what that pain was like, if you never experienced it, you could actually uh, check out this write-up I have as a recap of a closing keynote from Jason Leba from Google uh, a couple years back in Boston at Selenium Conf, where he described what it was like migrating millions of tests from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Um, fascinating, but this pattern was kind of the crux of how they were able to accomplish it. Um, and um, it's not necessary, but it certainly does add a ton of benefits.
So let's take a quick look at this. Here's a simple class for a base page object. There's just some methods in here that represent all the different function functionality that we want to use with Selenium. And so then all of our Selenium commands just go here in this one place. So there's a visit action, there's find elements, now just called find. We can just create whatever method we want to capture this behavior. So there's click, instead of send keys, we can just call the method type. Um, and then we can put our try catch here in the base page object. So, so now every page object that uses is displayed uh, from the base page object will magically get the exception handling that we need. So here it is implemented. Uh, in the login page object. So now we've taken all the Selenium commands out of this page object and just replaced them with these methods I created in the base page object. So it's just visit, is displayed, type, you know, et cetera. So that's pretty much it. So how everything fits together in this uh, mild architecture I just described is bottom up, where you have a base page object that wraps your Selenium commands. You have page objects which inherit this base class and then tests that use page objects. And once you have that, now we can move on to uh, the next of the, the kind of looming challenges, which is synchronization, kind of making your test resilient uh, when there's um, pages that, uh, that are just very you know, JavaScript heavy, for example. Um, so that, that relies on waiting. So there's three different ways to wait uh, with Selenium. Um, there's thread.sleep where it's just like you hard code a sleep value, and there's two functions built into Selenium. There's an implicit wait, and there are explicit waits. So um, I'm just gonna start off by saying, don't use a thread without sleep. <laughs> just, just don't. There are, uh, granted, there are very few, but there are exceptions where you might need a thread without sleep. But uh, it's, so, it's so rare, it's just, you should just assume that you're not gonna use it. Um, it's easy to say. Um, the, the disadvantage of using that is that you're basically forcing your tests to always wait however long you use a thread.sleep for. There's no dynamic waiting for it. But with implicit or explicit waits, it is, it is dynamic. Um, but I'll just go ahead and also say don't use an implicit wait. Just use explicit waits. Um, the, this, there's two reasons why I say that uh, before I actually tell you <laughs> what implicit and explicit waits are. But basically, um, an implicit wait uh, is a default that if a Selenium can't complete an action, it'll keep retrying that action. And uh, it doesn't cover all cases. There are times where it won't actually wait accordingly. Um, and also, if you use an implicit wait and also sprinkle in explicit waits, you're gonna run into issues that'll be transient test failures that's just gonna be hard to debug. The recommendation from the core committers of Selenium project and from most every practitioner I've ever met, including myself, um, just use explicit waits. You'll thank yourself later. It's a little more upfront work, just, but it's totally worth it. And if you want kind of a, a walkthrough of some different examples where I, I step through that and have some, some links to some different forum posts that describe some of these issues, then go to this, this link at the bottom of the page. So explicit waits, um, what they are. So you specify an amount of time and, in seconds and an action for Selenium to try to accomplish. And Selenium will try that action repeatedly uh, until it can either complete that action, or that amount of time that you specified has been reached and it will throw a time on exception. And so uh, here's, a, here's a quick example of something like that where you would want to use an explicit wait. Uh, you click a button and then it just, there's an indeterminate amount of time where this loading bar will go for it. And then once it's done, this text will appear and we'll want to say, figure out if it's displayed or not. So we'll use this idea finish. So of course we want to verify in the browser it's good practice. Now we're ready to potentially write a test for it. So what Selenium will do is if we say 10 seconds uh, and the loading bar only appears for five, it'll keep trying. And then after five seconds, it will be successful and it will move on to the next part of the test. Otherwise, it would keep trying until 10 seconds and then return a timeout. So what this looks like, um, if we go to our, the base page object I just uh, showed you earlier, we can actually create an overloaded method for is displayed, uh, where it receives a second parameter for max wait time. And uh, we can do a check for the visibility of the element located. This is in explicit weight parlance. This is the same thing as an is displayed check. And so what I've done is abstracted the core explicit weight functionality into this private method called wait for and uh, done a quick null check of the timeout just to say if we didn't specify a timeout, five seconds will be used. Um, and really the crux of this is this, these two lines here where we're creating a web driver wait uh, variable and then calling, creating an instance of WebDriverWait, passing it to the driver in the timeout, and then saying we want to wait until 
this condition is true. And the condition we're passing in the method above, visibility of element located, and we're passing a locator. So what that looks like, if we created a page object for that dynamic loading page, it would look like this, where we, you know, we have the locators at the top, um, and then there is a load example method that helps get us to the page and clicks the start button. The actual use of the explicit wait is here in this abstraction method for the checking to see if the finished text is present. So we're we're doing is displayed, and we're using this overloaded method that re receives a max wait time. So um, so that's explicit weights in a very brief walkthrough, but it's worth pointing out that there are some considerations when you go from browser to browser. The value proposition of Selenium is that you can write your test once and they'll run in every browser. Um, that's that's supported, obviously, but the it's a rosy proposition that's not entirely true. You can the, your test will run in other browsers, but you might run into timing issues that are slightly different uh, from browser to browser. The classic. Uh, the classic walkthrough is typically you'll start writing your tests in Firefox because that's the easiest thing to start with. You'll get them working, and then you'll plug into a grid or someone else's grid, run them on a different browser, like uh, IE, for example. And then maybe cert there's certain parts of your app that execute slower in IE, so then you might have some test failures that are different, and you have to go through and figure out which tests failed, kind of fine-tune them. And with explicit weights, that gives you these kind of pressure valves to go through and, and make adjustments. And then maybe you need to add some additional weights depending on how the application is behaving. And then you get those working in that browser. So now you have Firefox and IE. And then you say, okay, cool. Now we want to run them in Chrome. And then Chrome might execute faster um, than the previous two browsers you just tried. So then there might be some other timing issues. Uh, the point in this whole story is that that's normal. That's It's an iterative process to get tests working in one browser and then run them and fi figure out where, where there are holes in your uh, in your test, you know, your test being bulletproof and ready for kind of everything. Um, and then from just go through, make adjustments as needed, and then move on to the next browser until you have all of the browsers that you care about. Um, and that's pretty much it. So there's just some considerations as you step uh, through additional browsers with, with explicit weights. So step seven uh, of the 10-step process, kind of taking all of this test code and prepping it for use. Um, as I mentioned, there are open source Selenium frameworks, but most everybody just wants to build their own because uh, they think that their circumstances are unique and they may have a really good reason for it. So I want to arm you with kind of the core uh, pieces of functionality that go into a good test harness for Selenium. Uh, good organizational structure. Um, you want to have a good central setup and teardown. So there's one place where you're, when you're handling, getting the browser set up and run down appropriately. Uh, you want to make sure that it is configurable at runtime uh, with sensible defaults. So you can potentially change the base URL that you're, so which environment you're hitting at, which browser you're running it on, um, et cetera. There's numerous different things that, that may vary. And then you want to make sure that you have good reporting and logging. And of course, you want to make sure that your tests can be run in parallel. And then the last one is test grouping, making it so you can run subsets of your tests based on different metadata. So folder structure. Uh, I, hopefully it's fairly obvious, but you know, page objects belong in a page object folder, tests end up in a test folder. Um, and then breaking out from there, depending on the scale of your setup, there will be obvious uh, organizational structure that, that appears to you. I think the, the obvious place to start is don't try to engineer a folder structure, just wait to see if one organically appears. And it might just be, typically how it shakes out is components of an app, uh, and then having page objects that fit into subfolders based on those components, and same for tests. But really just see what fits for your context, but don't, don't try to engineer it at first, just try to see what happens organically. Central setup and teardown. Within JUnit, there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, the way that I've typically done it is using an external resource, which is a JUnit. Uh, function and Janet role, and it enables uh, you to use a uh, override before and after so that these methods will occur uh, around the annotations of app before and at after um, so that you get a Firefox driver and set up and torn down, um, and it plays nice with all the existing annotations that we're already using. So if you want more info on just Janet rules, you can check out the documentation at this link. And uh, what I mean by a simple config uh, with sensible defaults, here is one example. Uh, it's a static class just with some final string variables that we we populate by using runtime properties. So in this example, like base URL, 
uh, I'm using get property on base URL. Uh, so at, when you run the test, if you did Maven clean tests and then dash capital D base URL, you can override this value. But if nothing is provided, the second argument is used. So it'd just be the internet.herokuapp.com. And the same thing goes for the browser name, the, the host, whether or not I'm running locally on, on my machine or on a grid, uh, the version of the browser, which operating system, uh, and the other stuff are credentials for third-party providers, which I'll, I'll talk about at Sauce Labs in a minute. So once you have this, uh, you can import this config where it's needed. And so it would just be a simple import statement. Uh, static class, so you'd import static, and then you'd get access to all these variables. So the next piece, reporting and logging. Um, what I mean by this is logging as in machine readable, something like JNA XML that a continuous integration server can consume and get trend data over time. Uh, machine readable, uh, high bandwidth information that enables any, any person to look at the test failure and discern ideally what actually happened. It's, it's extremely helpful, especially for transient failures um, where either the tests are acting intermittently or the application is. So screenshots, um, failure message, pictures, et cetera, stack trace, everything you could possibly get. And uh, there's actually, um, up until a couple years ago, there really wasn't a great one-size-fits-all test reporting tool. Like, everyone kind of had to build their own. And then along came the Allure framework. Um, I mentioned HTML elements earlier uh, from a company called The Index. Well, they also created Allure, which is this great uh, test report generator that is language agnostic and has uh, bindings for pretty much every popular test framework that exists. So it's worth checking out. At this write-up, I do a walkthrough. But it generates, like, you take screenshots, it gets, it gets all the stack trace, all that information, and generates a, a slick little uh, Angular web app that has everything you need as a, as a really simple, elegant uh, test report. Uh, parallelization. I mentioned earlier wanting to have your tests be autonomous so that you can run them in parallel. Well, in your test framework, this is where you're going to put all that to use. And there's three different ways to handle parallelization, potentially. So you could write your own threading function uh, in code. You can uh, have your test runner. This is one of the huge advantages of using something like JUnit. Uh, or some continuous integration servers offer the functionality to run your tests in parallel for you. Um, the pro tip, uh, let your test runner do it within Java JUnit using something like the Maven Surefire plugin. Um, this is just like so simple to set up that it's it, it, there's nothing more to say. Just use it. It works. And the biggest uh, pro tip, like the step above, just making sure your tests run in parallel, make sure your tests also run in a random order. Um, and this is something that's turnkey within Maven Surefire. So it's just another config value to set and get your tests running in random order. This has two subtle benefits. Um, the first one is that uh, you'll be ex exercising the application in a random order each time the test runs, so you might actually identify some other issues that you might not have found otherwise. And the other one is it'll help uh, identify inner, inner test dependencies that you missed um, that are causing weird test failures, and it'll help you make sure your tests are a little more bulletproof over time. And then I mentioned uh, test grouping, the ability to run subsets of tests um, by using metadata in JUnit. You use what's called categories, and this enables what uh, Goiko Atzig uh, refers to as test packs, the ability to take the corpus of your test and say, oh, I just want to run like uh, a test from, from this component, this component, this component, which make up potentially a critical subset of my tests that are fast for, and give me fast feedback. And so there's some category ideas. Um, I've seen some creative uses of categories, um, things like instead of, instead of just having a defect tracker where you describe uh, the issue. You could actually have an automated test or a set of automated tests that actually exercise that functionality and prove that it fails. And then you could tag it or use a category to mark those as defects. Um, uh, I believe Adam Goucher coined the term of shallow and deep tests instead of like smoke and regression. You think of shallow being like uh, the top layer of the application, which is actually super critical stuff that discerns if the application is healthy or not. And then deep tests would be a, a deeper dive through features of the application, and these might be slower running tests as well. I've also seen people use um, the, the release that these features were built in or the story number that they apply to as well uh, so that they can create a grouping of, uh, of tests to run that are for a specific release coming up. And if you want more info on JUnit categories, uh, take a look at this link.
So now that we have all of those things sorted out, we have good tests running, we wanna make sure that they can run in other browsers. And so the way to do that is by leveraging Selenium for what it's good at. And so locally, uh, you, can, you can run your tests locally on different browsers, assuming you have the correct operating system for the different browsers that are available. Um, so Chrome, Firefox, IE Driver, and more recently, Microsoft Edge uh, and Safari. Um, each one requires a what's called a browser driver. It's a small little binary shim that sits on the machine, and it's what enables Selenium to talk to the browser at the application level. Uh, each one has a very similar kind of configuration, but each one is necessary. And it's the same thing that's going to be required if you're using, using it locally or remotely. But these links go to each of the different browser driver pages. So for Chrome, for example, um, you would need to download Chrome driver, and there's, you'd either have to add it to your system path or specify uh, in code where it is. And so there is a, a system property that Selenium will look at, webdriver.chrome.driver, and if you specify the full path to Chrome driver, it will pick it up and, and know what to do with it. So then after that, it's just calling new Chrome driver, and then you're all set. Um, in this example here, within a JUnit, uh, Maven project, I've created a vendor folder and then I'm using the user dir uh, system property to create a uh, fully qualified URL that is uh, that will work regardless uh, if it's on my system or your system, etc. So this is just one way to capture that in code and make it so it will always work. So I mentioned remote and grid a couple of times, so let's talk about what Selenium Grid is. So Selenium Grid is the way that you're able to scale your tests outward. So you have your tests, you would point your tests at a grid hub. And these are, uh, this is a machine that would be stood up somewhere, something that you own and maintain that receives your tests and helps discern which browser and operating system to give you. And it is connected to a bunch of different grid nodes, different machines with different browsers and operating systems. And then each of those has a browser. And so then your test, the grid hub returns back the browser so then the test is able to execute on the browser on the operating system that you want. And so all this is done with one jar file, the Selenium standalone server, and it just requires some additional runtime flags. And what that looks like here is if you stand up a hub, um, you just say java dash jar Selenium standalone server dash role hub. And then ta-da, you now have a Selenium grid hub. And then for nodes, each of the nodes you do something similar, java dash jar Selenium server standalone, and then dash role would be node, and then you say dash hub, and then specify the URL. Now granted, this setup example is how to do it on just one machine. You would have these actions and these, uh, you'd have these things being done on different machines. So one would be a hub, another machine would be node, and so on and so forth. And that's how you create a mesh network of, uh, of browsers and operating systems, so you can scale your tests. Um, so once you have the 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 grid stand, standing up and working, this is the simple configuration change you have to make to your test code in that central setup and teardown. So you would just have to use what's called desired capabilities. It's just an object that you you set capabilities on. So the capabilities being platform, browser name, uh, browser version, etc. And then you connect using Selenium Remote to this grid, to the hub, and pass in this capabilities object. And that's what the, the hub will look at, is the capabilities object, and say, oh, I know which to send you to. Here you go. Some additional things um, to kind of dig in further, you could check out this getting started write-up I did, I did on a little bit more in depth of a walkthrough with Selenium Grid. And then there's two open source libraries that are really worth mentioning if you're gonna embark on standing up your own Selenium Grid, which is not for everybody, I will say. Um, so there's Selenium Grid Extras, which uh, came out of Groupon. Uh, Dima Kovalenko, who is actually one of the uh, grid maintainers uh, on the Selenium project, uh, he, he actively maintains Selenium Grid Extras, which is a really cool library that helps maintenance uh, and setup of a grid, um, makes it a lot easier. And so there's a, there's a write-up that link on what that is and what are the benefits of it. And then out of Retail Me Not uh, came Selenium Grid Scaler, which is a open source library as well, and uh, it, it's basically for 
ideally easy, scalable setup using Amazon Web Services. So basically you point at your Amazon account and then it will spin up a grid based on what you ask it to do and then it will monitor it and then continue to grow it based on the demands that you put on it and then tear it down when it's done. Alternative to doing your own grid, um, there are third-party companies out there. The most notable one is Sauce Labs. Um, it's most notable because it was it's the one that's been doing it the longest, and it was also created by uh, co-funded by the creator of, of Selenium, Jason Huggins. Um, so very similar to a grid, you have your tests, you point at Sauce Labs, which is effectively just a proprietary Selenium grid hub, and then they have a massive Selenium grid that has a browser, whatever browser you want, whatever operating system you need. And so uh, I could get really in the weeds on Sauce Lab stuff, but I'll let this uh, article do the talking for me. It's another write-up I've done where I step through how to use Sauce Labs. And if you want to see how to use Sauce Labs with something like Apple Tools for automated visual testing, then check out this link. So now we're into the home stretch here, the last two things that we really need to focus on. The first one is building an automated feedback loop. Um, really, this is kind of like why we're doing it. So, feedback loops. Um, obviously, uh, hopefully, obviously, it's like we want to find failures early and often. And so, uh, we want to do that with continuous integration and notifications. Like, those are the, like, the bread and butter of how we're going to make this happen. And so, some examples of notifications, the obvious stuff, like, for remote people, it'd be email, it'd be chat, it'd be text messages. For in-person stuff, for co-located teams, there'd be audiovisual indicators. I've seen, like, glowing orbs. I've seen stoplights uh, that are, like, all basically as a means to say, hey, something's broken. Take a look at it. Um, so with all that being said, I have this kind of simple thought uh, of what that looks like, what a, what a simple code promotion using continuous integration with automated tests within your existing uh, development process, what that looks like. So uh, code gets committed, and then unit and integration tests run on a continuous integration server, right? The CI server is going to be polling or running on a schedule uh, to grab in the latest changes. Unit integration tests run if they pass then deploy uh, the application to an automated environment, an, an environment specifically for automated testing. Uh, and I say that specifically because I've worked with teams where they have their manu they have people who do manual testing and UAT, user acceptance testing, and automated tests all running in the same environment, and they potentially could be stepping on each other's toes. Maybe they're using the same account. Uh, or sim similar accounts, similar functionality, and one's taking a destructive action and it just trips up the other one. So really, ideally, it would be an environment dedicated for automated testing. And if that deployment is successful, um, then run the automated tests. Ideally, it would just be a subset of the tests using categories, something that identifies really critical functionality. And then, assuming those automated tests run and pass, then you should reasonably say, hey, we could deploy to the next environment or notify someone to say, hey, I think we're ready if you want to take a deeper look. Like, but really, the cursory stuff should be taken care of. The most, the most obvious example I would say is if you want to make this the simplest possible pass through all of this code promotion stuff, just run, like, run a login test. Just make sure that login actually works. If that doesn't work, then something is really broken. Um, and that's it. Uh, and then, of course, you can add in other stuff, like really super valuable things. But I've seen it work where we I set this test, this exact same workflow up for a client, and and it and it worked wonders because what happens what happened is that the application would get deployed overnight, and then manual testers would come in and actually for perform work in the morning. And and what would happen is if the application was broken, then they wouldn't be able to do work for a couple hours till the developers rolled in. And instead, what we did was set up a, a checkpoint where, you know, crucial automated tests ran like a login test, and then it would it would actually notify the developers uh, when the deployment happened at night if something broke, and then they'd be able to fix it remotely. So then when the testers came in in the morning, they were able to not be blocked. So this kind of stuff, you know, for, for kind of a team that's, that's still working through migrating from manual testing to automated testing is an old way of thinking. This is like, this is a good stepping stone, but something like this could easily help push you to continuous delivery, et cetera. So food for thought. Uh, obviously, if none of these are a yes, if they're, if they're a no, you want to notify the team. Bonus points if you can actually stop the line, make it so everybody takes this seriously to the point where uh, nobody can continue until they actually fix this issue. Ideally, the best companies, the ones I've seen that are most successful, are the ones that treat this kind of a thing uh, with the same care that they treat feature development for the business. 
So um, just a quick idea about what a simple CI configuration looks like with Jenkins, a very popular open source continuous integration uh, testing tool, or sorry, continuous integration uh, system. Uh, you would create a job with Jenkins and you'd pull in your test code, you'd set up these build triggers, so it could either be a schedule or based on uh, looking at some other job. Uh, you want to configure the steps of the build so your tests know how to run, and then you configure the test report so that when you have the machine readable and the human readable stuff, you pull that in, and then you set notifications. One of the coolest things about Jenkins is that there are thousands of plugins available, and there's one for every kind of chat client. There's you know there's some for text messaging, there's some for emails. It's very easy to set up notifications. Um, and then you want to run your tests manually, view the results, make sure that the job is working like you think, and then you're all set. And high five your neighbor, which is the most important step. Celebrate your success. So now that you got all that covered, um, you may be ready. You may be like, cool, I'm ready to go at it, but then you might get stuck. Uh, and you'd be like, I need to go and find some information. Um, and so rather than just Googling around until you find a random Stack Overflow post that may or may not answer your question, I encourage you to take a look at this page, which I, I curate uh, kind of a list of all the different available Selenium resources and what they're good for. Uh, and I try to update it every six months or so. Um, and so this is every available resource um, that I found, including books, including forums, including video resources, uh, conferences, meetups, et cetera, um, mailing lists, you name it. I, I really try to capture it there and say whether or not it's worthwhile and if it is, uh, which pieces are the best. And so the single best resource listed on there is the Selenium IRC chat channel. Uh, the single best place to go and ask a question if you can't find the answer online. It's a chat channel where the core committers of the project and a bunch of practitioners hang out and just answer questions all day long. So um, what it is, how to, how to connect to it and all that is in that post. So uh, the steps to solve the puzzle of Selenium within your organization. Um, first step, uh, define a test strategy and then pick a programming language and then, of course, use Selenium for what it's good at. And then, once you've done that, write your first test with good testing principles in mind. And then, you want to make sure that your tests are reusable and maintainable, uh, so you have good test code for that. And then, of course, you want to make your tests resilient by using explicit weights. And then, you want to package your tests up into a framework, a test harness. And then, you want to add in cross-browser uh, execution using either a grid or someone else's grid. And then of course, you want to build an automated feedback loop with continuous integration. And then you want to find information on your own. And so if you do that, then you're able to write business valuable tests that are reusable, maintainable, and resilient across all relevant browsers. And you want to package them and scale them for you and your team. And I'll leave you with this quote. You may think your puzzle is unique, but really everyone is trying to solve the same puzzle. Yours is just configured differently and it's solvable. And you can quote me on it. So uh, I would like to end, before we go into questions, just mentioning a couple of quick things. Um, the first one is I have a book that covers everything I just talked about in depth as kind of a self-study course. Um, and it also covers a bunch of other stuff too, uh, common pitfalls you run into, challenges that just aren't documented, et cetera. Um, but uh, you get a free sample of it. Uh, the first six chapters are available at this link. And uh, the book right now is available in Java and Ruby. And if you don't see a language that you'd like, uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, and Python are coming soon. Um, if you get a sample, regard, even if the language isn't something you're looking for, grab one of the samples, um, just sign up for the sample form, and you'll receive notice notifications about uh, the languages as they become available. I'm going to be doing a Kickstarter coming soon, um, so I can just cover all these languages this year. And all um, there is a free shirt giveaway, t-shirt giveaway uh, from Apple Tools. So um, sign up for a free Apple Tools Eyes account at this link and uh, you know, run your first visual test. And then email webinars at appletools.com and then they will mail you a t-shirt and then you can support your new visually perfect tee. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave this slide up here uh, while, we, while we handle questions. Okay, Dave, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, we've actually run a bit long with the webinar, but we'll take uh, two short questions. How about that?
That sounds good. And then we could uh, go through the list of questions and maybe do a follow-up blog post. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Um, so the first one uh, is from Richard. How do you deal with dynamic pages and animations on page during a test? So animations and dynamic pages, well, I guess I'd, I'd want to get clarity around maybe specifics because dynamic pages, if you want to unpack that a bit, it could be dynamic IDs on a page um, versus pages that just have dynamically loading content. Those, those vary depending on what, you know, what it's doing. But if there's, I mean, if there's animations, that's, um, I guess it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish on the page. I would I would really go back to um, what is the functionality you're trying to verify, and are you able to uh, identify locators that enable you to accomplish that? Um, if it's dynamically generated uh, locators and there's no good semantic markup on the page, that becomes a lot more challenging, um, and then that might just really require a conversation uh, with with the front end devs to to see if there's a way to to really navigate that. Otherwise, if they're the other option is like maybe it's just the page is constructed using things that are hard to automate with Selenium, which which does happen. Like if you're dealing with Canvas, uh, which just renders drawings on the page, that could be really hard to interact with. Um, there might be some real challenges there. Again, it just it, it really depends on how the typically how the page is constructed and what locators are available. Um, but but it's for the most part like nine out of ten times it's a solvable thing um, and if it's not something that's obvious just by looking at the markup of the page having a conversation with a front-end dev could could very well solve it because they can maybe add some locators to the page for you okay great so the next question is from Greg why is any tuning necessary if we use explicit weights it seems like the very usage of them should solve latency issues that might come from browser performance and network issues uh, that's a great question. Um, so typically, it really de the easiest answer is it depends on how you're using explicit weights in terms of what's the timing timeout that you're setting. So if you set like five seconds for something, and maybe uh, there are just things that take longer, um, like is that something that you want the test to fail on or not? So if if you set five seconds, but maybe it took seven seconds because it's just a little bit slower in that browser, um, do you do you want to adjust to seven or ten seconds, or you know do you want to, or maybe you're just missing something that requires another explicit weight. Ideally, for the most part, if you're using explicit weights and you're setting a reasonable enough timeout, like maybe like at the most like fifteen seconds, really it depends on the application's performance as well. Um, then then it solves most issues. What I was I'm just trying to level set expectations that. Um, if you use explicit weights and you use different browsers and you have no problems, great, you're in the minority. But it does happen, um, and it does cover most usage, uh, usage issues. And everyone's on a spectrum in terms of how many how many different issues they might have as they go from browser to browser. So for the most part, explicit weights will cover it, um, but but there are times where it won't, uh, and you just need to make make fine tune adjustments. Okay, I am afraid that's all the time we have. So, Dave, I want to thank you for this uh, really awesome webinar, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. As I mentioned before, the webinar was recorded, and we will send you the recording tomorrow. And uh, any questions that are left uh, unanswered, we will take them up in an email later, uh, personally. So, thank you again. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.